Richard James Mathematics Resources will present Grade 4, Practice Paper 3, Part B. And uh, Part B will have the second phase of 12 questions going from number 13 to number 24. Which number represents the most bottles? So which one represents the most bottles? This is just a simple question asking which number is the largest of the lot. So in all of these options, which one is the largest number? Option A. Option A. How do you know that it is option A? Okay, so according to Jerry, A is the one that represents the largest number because it begins with 7. The others begin with 6, 5, and 1. So it begins with the largest number. So what we will do, we will put Jerry's statement into context and we will say it like this. So, right here, although they are not completely necessary, we are including the place values of the digits. The only use that the place values have is to say which one is the largest. But we know the leftmost one is the largest, so we do not need them. So, if we look at those place values, the largest place value is thousands but we are sure that the leftmost digit is the largest therefore we do not need to have those place values the leftmost digit contributes the most to the value of the number so the leftmost digit which is this one it contributes the most to the value of the number therefore the number that has the largest leftmost digit is the largest one we can just make that can come to that conclusion because all of the numbers have the same number of digits they therefore have the same place value for the largest place value which is the leftmost digit so we are sure that because all of these numbers have the same digits they all have the same place value for the leftmost digit therefore we are sure that the one with the largest leftmost digit will be the largest number. The leftmost digit contributes the most to the value of the number. They all have the same number of digits and therefore all have the same leftmost digit. As a matter of fact, what we mean is that the leftmost digit will have the same place value because the numbers have the same number of digits the one with the largest digit there will represent the most bottles so we are looking at the leftmost digit the one that contributes the most to the value of the number because they all have the same number of digits and the one with the largest leftmost digit is actually the one which represents the most bottles and that is option A. The correct answer is option A. If we had a tie, then we would compare the digits of less significance, which is located to the right. So say we had a tie here, then we would have to compare these digits. 
Also, if there was one with a digit more significant than the other, it would be the answer. For example, if we had another number with, say, five digits, and all of the digits are non-zero, that means there is no zero in any of the digits, and we had five digits, the five-digit number would automatically be the largest number. Why? Because its leftmost digit would be more significant than the leftmost digit of the others. If the problem were to be like this, in which we had a tie for the largest digit in the most significant position. Cancel the other numbers and consider the digit of less significant. If the problem were like this, in which we had a tie for the largest digit in the most significant position, cancel the other numbers and consider the digit of less significance. Therefore, if we had a tie like this, 7, 7 here, notice that we are comparing the leftmost digit, the most significant digit. The one with the largest leftmost digit will be the largest number. But we have a tie for the largest leftmost digit. Therefore, what do we do? We know that the others cannot be the largest. So we will cancel those. And we know that we are talking about these two numbers. This one and this one. So because there is a tie for the leftmost digit, then we would compare these. When we compare these, what do we know? That there is still a tie. So what will we do, Jerry? Right, so we will compare the other column to the right. So they are still equal, so we will still have to go to the digit of less significance. The digit in A is 6, and the one in C is 1. The correct option would still be option A. A. So when it gets right down to it, the one that we have here is larger than the one that we have here. Therefore, this number is larger than this. So by comparing these two digits, they are the same. They are the same here. Then we move to the others, and this one is greater. Therefore, this one turns out to be the largest number of the lot. The leftmost digit is called the digit of greatest significance because it contributes the most to the value of the number. It does not matter what the digits of less significance are. The number with the largest digit in the most significant place value position will be the largest number. So it does not matter what the digits of less significance are. The number with the largest digit in the most significant place value position will be the largest number. Why is it that it does not matter? We will take a look at that maybe on a different slide, but we will continue here. Look at those numbers. They do not have the same number of digits. As long as there is no decimal fraction to contend with, the one with the largest number of digits has to be the largest number. And why is that so? So that one has the largest number of digits and turns out to be the largest number. It has to be the largest number. Why? Why is that so? It has the leftmost digit with the largest place value. So if we should put the place values in, 
then we are at this spot. Then what do we know? That whatever we have here, then the place value to the left is going to be 10 times this place value. Therefore, because at any position that we are, the digit to the left is of greater significance, then we are sure that this number 7 will be of greater significance than all of these digits that we have here. Hence, this number will be the largest number. It does not matter how many thousands the other numbers have. It is the only one with tens of thousands. It has to be the largest number. So even if we had a 9 here, because the largest digit that can be placed in any position is a 9. So if this turns out to be, say, 9,000, this one, 9,000, the next column represents tens of thousands, and 10 is always going to be greater than 9. Therefore, no matter what digits we have here, as long as a number has a digit of greater significance, then that number would be larger. If we had decimal fractions, we would have to make sure that the numbers are properly aligned or give consideration to the location of the decimal point in arriving at our conclusion. What is the value of the 9 in 1946? What is the value of the 9 there, Jerry? 900. Magnify the number and assign the place values of the digits. According to the statement of the problem, our digit of focus is... Nine. That is our digit of focus. In a number, the value of a digit is dependent on two factors. One, its face value. Its face value. The face value is the actual size of the digit. So that digit is a nine its face value is 9. The second one, its place value, which is its value because of its position relative to other digits. So it has another value, which is because of its position relative to the other digits. And that 9 is in what position? Hundreds. Right, it is located in the hundreds column. Because it is located in the hundreds column, we know that the value of that 9 is going to be equal to the face value, which is 9, multiplied by the place value which is 100 the value of the digit is the product of its place value and its face value so the face value is 9 and the place value is 100 so the value of the number is dependent on two things the place value and the face value so the value of the number is the product of those two. The correct answer is C. option C. By glancing at the number, candidates may say that 9 is the position of the third digit and mistakenly call it 9000 because that's a possibility because it is the 
third digit from this region, one, two, three, students may say that the nine is in the thousands position and say nine thousand. Giving consideration to the place values is very important. Without writing down the place values, some students may spot the answer immediately. However, in an examination, students are still in a learning process and they are required to adhere to the form as stipulated in the statement of the problem. It is not mere sticking to a form. It is showing that the value of a digit is the product of its face value and its place, place value. So although it is important for students to stick to the formats that we learn because they are important, because they give order, they give logic, they give sense, to our work it is not a mere just sticking to a particular form it is showing that the value of a digit is the product of its face value and its place value which is an improper fraction how do we know an improper fraction at this stage we should all know the parts of a fraction but let us bring them forward as a reminder we have a fraction bar the top number is the numerator and the lower number is the denominator any fraction that has its denominator larger than its numerator is called a proper fraction if the fraction has its numerator larger than the denominator then it is improper but any fraction that has its denominator larger than its numerator that is called a proper fraction all of those fractions are proper fractions their numerators are smaller than the denominators or we may say the denominators are larger than the numerators on the other hand if the numerator is larger than the denominator the fraction is called an improper fraction so the one with the numerator larger than the denominator that one is called an improper fraction the correct answer is represented by option C. if the numerator and the denominator are equal then the fraction represents one whole so if the numerator and the denominator are equal then the fraction represents a whole it does not matter if it is three thirds eight eighths ten tenths a hundred and thirty five over a hundred and thirty five or ninety one over ninety one it does not matter as long as the numerator and the denominator are equal then the fraction represents one whole fractions that are written in that form whether they are proper improper or represent a whole they are called vulgar fraction 
any fraction that is written numerator, denominator, and fraction bar, that fraction is called a vulgar, a vulgar fraction. So there we have some vulgar fractions. The first two are proper. That one is one whole. Right. Those are vulgar fractions. A number that is a mixture of a whole number and a fraction, usually proper, or the number contains a whole number and a fraction, the fraction is usually proper, and that is known as a mixed number. In the olden days, they were called mixed fractions, but now they call them mixed numbers. Remember now that in a mixed number, the fraction part is usually proper in a mixed number. A number that contains a decimal point is a decimal fraction, and that is whether or not the whole number part is equal to zero. So that's a decimal fraction, that one also. So we have those decimals, decimal fractions. Write the decimal fraction in vulgar form. How do you write that decimal fraction in vulgar form? How do you write that? All of the digits of the number are placed in the numerator with the power of 10 in the denominator. So, in writing a decimal fraction in vulgar form, we will place all of the digits in the numerator without the decimal point. So, all of the digits of the number is placed in the numerator with the power of 10 in the denominator. The number of digits to the right of the decimal point will tell us the number of trailing zeros in the power of 10. So, in writing this in vulgar form, Take the 4023, write that without any decimal point. Then you count the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. And that will tell us the number of zeros that we need to have in the power of 10. So how many digits do we have to the right of the decimal point? So how many zeros do we need to have in the denominator? Four. That's all there is to it. It does not matter if there is a whole number portion of the number. So we have a whole number in that one. What do we do? We write all of the digits of the number without any decimal point and what do we do? We count the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. So the number of digits in the decimal fraction will be the number of zeros in the power of 10. So the number of digits that we have right there, 1, 2, 3, in the fractional part will be the number of zeros we have in the power of 10. So how many zeros will we have in the power of 10 in this case, Jerry? 3, 2. Right, so we have 2 digits to the right of the decimal point. The number of digits that follow to the right of the decimal point tells us the number of zeros. So two zeros. So that's all there is to it. And that is how we convert a decimal fraction to a vulgar fraction. Some of the fractions may be reduced, but I don't see any of the ones that we have in this particular case that can be reduced. But sometimes we can reduce the fractions after we have written them in vulgar form. 
So when writing a fraction in a decimal fraction in vulgar form, we count the number of digits to the right of the decimal point, and that will be the number of zeros in the power of 10 that is placed in the denominator of the fraction. What is another name for the 2 in 129? What is another name for the 2 in 129? There we have our place values. What is another name for the 2? What may we call it? 2, 12, 20 or 200? Is it option A, B, C or D? Right, it is option C. Because the two that we have there represent two tens. And the two tens are? 20. 20. We are focusing on the two on this occasion. We already know that the value of a digit in a number is dependent on its place value and its face value so it's dependent on two things so there we have the face value is 2 the face value is the actual size of the digit which is 2 and then the second thing that it is dependent on is the place value and the place value is its value because of its position relative to other digits So that two represent two tens. The value of the digit is the product of its place value and its face value. So two times ten and that is equal to twenty. 20. The correct answer is option C. How many tens and ones are in the set? We can do this in a number of ways. This one, Jerry should find very enjoyable. How many tens and ones are in the set? Tens and ones. Any way that we will solve the problem, it will require that we count the number of hearts that we have there. So let us go ahead and count them. In order to determine the number of tens and ones that we have there, we will have to count them. If we do not know the number of them that we have, then we cannot know the number of tens and ones. And Jerry counted them already. How many of them do we have, Jerry? We have. How many tens? No, how many hearts? Oh, 20. So we have 20 of them. There are 20 of them. If we include the number with the place values of the digits, then this will simplify our work. 20 of them. And what do we notice about that 20? 20 has what? Two tens. And? Zero ones. Right, so we have two tens and zero ones. Or we may say, Two tens and no ones. Two tens and zero ones. The tens digit is two and the ones digit is zero. The correct answer is therefore option B. Option B. It is as easy as that. Count them, we get 20. Put in the place values, we have two tens and no ones. And there we have it in option B. As long as we know the number of them, we could just identify the answer without such a lengthy process. Tens and ones. Since we need the number of tens and ones, let us group them in sets of tens 
and what remains will be the ones. ones. Right, so we group them in sets of tens. We need the number of tens and ones. So we will group them in sets of tens. Ten, right. Sets of ten. So that is the first group of ten. Do we have any other group of ten? Yes. Yes, we have another. There it is. How many groups of ten do we have? Two. There are only two of them. The red one and the green one. So all of those say two tens. The leftovers would be the One. ones. How many leftovers are there? None. Okay, because there is no leftovers, then zero. There is no leftover, there is no ones digit. The correct answer is therefore option B. B. Which represents seven and nine hundredths? Seven and nine hundredths. What is a hundredth, Jerry? What is a hundredth? One over one hundred. Right. One hundredth is one part of a whole that is divided into 100 equal parts but it is not so easy to have a whole divided into a hundred equal parts on this slide so we can take a look at its numerical value a hundred is one part out of a hundred as long as we get the hundredth part right we will not have any difficulty with the rest of it. A hundredth is one of the parts if the whole is divided into a hundred equal parts. We are required to write a fraction with one hundred as the denominator because a hundredth is one part of a whole that was divided into 100 equal parts that is a hundredth what about nine hundredths the numerator will tell us the number of parts of the whole that we are talking about and the denominator will tell us the number of equal parts that the whole is divided into and since we are talking about hundredths, the wall is divided into a hundred equal parts. The denominator of the fraction is therefore one hundred. So which represents seven and nine hundredths? Option B. Option B. Terry is saying that it is option B. The numerator is 9. It tells us the number of equal parts out of the 100 that we are talking about. So there we have 9 parts out of 100. Or 9 section out of walls that were divided into 100 equal parts. And as I outlined before, we may have more than a hundred hundredths because we may have many holes that are divided into a hundred equal parts and if we have seven holes that are divided into a hundred equal parts we will have seven hundred hundredths and in that case the numerator would be seven hundred which is greater than a hundred so the nine means nine of those pieces if the whole is divided into a hundred equal parts the seven represents seven walls 
and in a mixed number the whole number precedes the fraction or is to the left of the fraction so 7 represents 7 wholes the correct answer is represented by Option B, as Jerry pointed out to us long ago. In the number, what is that number, Jerry? Read that number for us. 1,529. 1,529. Which digit has the greatest value? One. One. Jerry is saying is that one. How can we have nine five and two yet still the one has the greatest value because there is saying that it is in the thousand place value position it is easy to say the leftmost digit but let us place the numbers under the microscope with the place values of the digits So there we have the place values of the digits and according to Jerry Lewis the one has the greatest value and he said that because it represents 1000 in any number the digit with the greatest value has to be the one with the largest place value except that number is equal to zero with the exception of if that digit is equal to zero so only if that digit is equal to zero then it will not count but as long as the digit is a non-zero digit In any number, the digit with the greatest value has to be the one with the largest place value. One is in the largest place value position. Option A is therefore correct. So it does not matter in a number if the face value of the digits are larger or the face value of the digit do not matter unless you are comparing another number with the same number of digits but as long as you are talking about a single number if the digits are non-zero the one with the largest place value will be the largest digit and the one with the largest place value in this particular case is 1. It represents 1,000 while the others are less than 1,000. So it does not matter the size of the digits that follow. The one in the largest place value position will have the greatest value. Option A is correct. Why is it that the leftmost digit has to be the one with the greatest value? For example, why is it that a digit in the hundreds position will not be able to have a greater value than one in the thousands position? Why is this so? As long as the digit is in the hundreds position, it will not have or cannot have a greater value than a non-zero digit that is located in the thousands position why is that so we will see why it is so why is it that the leftmost digit has to be the one with the greatest value for example why is it that a digit in the hundreds position will not be able to have a greater value than one in the thousands position why is that so
there we have the digits with their respective place values the largest possible digit in any position is 9 while the place value to the left is always 10 times the present place value 10 is always greater than 9 so for example we have 900 here to the left we have 1000 because this is just 9 but the place value to the left is always 10 times the present place value then this one is always going to be larger in value because this represents 10 times what we have here and this is what 9 which means 9 hundreds which is 9 times 100 while the place value to the left is 10 times this one so it is 10 times 100 and that is why the digit to the left or the leftmost digit in a number as long as it is not equal to zero will have the largest value or contribute the largest amount to the number what is the value of 9 in the number overall overall value is equal to face value multiplied by place value so the value of the 9 there is 9 times 100 which is equal to 900, 900. what is the value of the 1 to the immediate left thousand. right it is in the greater place value position which is a thousand so it is 1 times 1000 which is equal to 1000 which one is greater 1, right because 1000 is greater than 900 then we are sure that the place value or the digit to the left the leftmost digit in a number has to be larger than every other digit it has to be the greatest contributor to the size of the number than every other digit because of its position as long as it is not equal to zero one thousand is greater than nine hundred however what we have is true only for non-zero digits if a digit is zero no matter where it is located it will not contribute to the value of the number which position comes just after fifth the numbers that we have there are ordinal numbers first second sixth seventh they are all ordinal numbers they tell us the order in which events occur for example the order in which athletes finish a race so the first ordinal number is for position one that is the highest position and it is called first position two comes after and is called position three is next and it is called third. it is called third position four which is called fourth, fourth. and uh, it the series will continue just after fifth just after fifth means immediately after the one just after fifth is six option C is correct some students usually confuse the smaller ordinal number with a lower position but the ones that are after lower in positions are actually the larger ordinal numbers so which position comes just after fifth so that position that comes after fifth 
we are inclined to call it a lower position. And because it is a lower position, some candidates might choose a smaller number. But the higher positions belong to the smaller ordinal numbers. And the larger ordinal numbers are for the lower position. So if somebody finishes lower than you do, then his ordinal number is going to be larger instead of smaller. So if someone finishes just after fifth, his ordinal number is sixth. In which picture is a half shaded? Jerry is saying that it is option D. Why is it that D is the correct answer, Jerry? Because all the rest are less than a half. Or A is less than a is three quarter. The other one. B is three quarter itself, and C is way above half. And option D is the half. There's a half side, and there's a blank. There's a shaded area that in the, that shows that it is a half. Okay, all right. So Jerry went at length to explain why option D is correct so Jerry is saying that option D is correct and we have half and option D is actually correct a half means more than just a fraction that is equal to 1 over 2 what is the one of the most significant things about the half we have our fraction there and we have the numerator, the denominator, and we have the fraction bar. The denominator tells us the number of equal parts that the whole is divided into. The numerator tells us the number of those equal parts spoken about. Each picture has one out of two parts shaded, but that does not make it a half for them to be halves the two parts have to be equal. equal. That is what we mean by a half. One out of two parts does not make it a half. One out of two equal parts. So what we are saying is that essentially in each one of these two parts are in each one of them. It is divided into two. We have two sections, two sections, two sections. We have two sections. But two sections does not mean that the object is divided into halves. It is divided into halves when the two sections are equal. equal. Option D is the only one in which the two parts seem to be equal. The correct answer is therefore option D. Dividing an object into two parts does not make them halves. Only when they are equal, they are two halves. How many groups of six are in the set of shapes? Groups of six. How many groups of six? are in the shapes. We have many ways that we can solve this problem, Jerry. Tell me one way you would solve this problem. How many groups of six are in those shapes? Three. You say three? Yes. How do you know it's three? Because it's 18. 18, let's see. Because those do not look like 18 to me. Anyway, that we will solve the problem Counting the shapes will simplify our method. So any way that we will solve the problem, counting the shapes will simplify our method.
Okay. So now that we have 15, Jerry is saying that how many groups of six do we have there? Two. Right, so Jerry is saying it's two. Well, that is what you should have done earlier on. Count them, because as soon as you count them, you will see the number of groups of six that we have there. There are 15 of them. Dividing by six is one way that we can find the number of groups of six. So we take 15 and we divide by 6. And when we are dividing by 6, which one of our multiplication tables come into play, Jerry? 6 times. Six times. So when we are dividing by 6, we have to give heed to our 6 times table. So there it is. 6 1 6, 6 2 is 12, 6 3 is 18. You have to remember those because I am not going to put them on this slide again. We say 6 into 1. What do we do? 6 into 1. Right. 6 cannot go into 1 a whole number of times. We then say 6 into 15. 15. So we include an additional digit. So we will say 6 into 15 and that will go how many times? Two times. How do we know that 6 can go into 15 two times? Because Because 6 times Because what? 6 times 2 6 times 2 is 12 is 12, right. 6 2's 12, twelve. What about six threes? Six threes, eighteen. Right. So fifteen is less than eighteen, but it is greater than twelve. So we are sure that six can go into fifteen at least two times. Yes. Okay. Six into fifteen, two times. Six twos, twelve, and six threes, eighteen. It means that 6 will go into 15 how many times? 2 times because 15 is greater than 12. But can it go 3 times? No. Because 15 is? Less than 18. Right, because 15 is less than 18. So it will not be able to go as many as 3 times. It means that there will be a remainder of Right, 15 minus 12 is equal to 3. But the problem said nothing about a remainder. The answer, therefore, is option B. B. Because it did not ask about a remainder. How many groups of 6 are in this set of shapes? So we know that we have 15 of them. If we divide 15 by 6, we will get 2. Although we have remainders, there was nothing said about remainders in the statement of the problem. And we are attempting to take another approach in solving the problem. Since we need the number of groups of six, we may group them in sets of six. So there we have one set of six. There we have another set of six. Do we have another set of six after that green set? No. Okay. How many groups of six do we have? Two. There are two groups of six and there are also three leftovers. The statement of the problem asks for the number of groups of six and said nothing about the remainder. There are only two of them, two groups of six, the red one and the green one. The correct answer is therefore option B. Which fraction names the shaded portion in these drawings, 
which fraction names the shaded portion in these drawings which one which fraction names the shaded portion in these drawings option B D okay option D we have three rectangles each of them is divided into six equal parts each one of them is divided into how many equal parts six. we can see that we have six equal parts if each is divided into six parts the six will represent what in a fraction? Six four. Six equal parts. Right. Six equal parts. And what part of a fraction represents the number of equal parts? The, lo the denominator. Right. The denominator is the one that will represent the number of equal parts in a whole. Being divided into six equal parts means that each of those parts is called a sixth a sixth so there we have a sixth the number of equal parts that the whole is divided into represents the denominator of the fraction the number of equal parts that the whole is divided into represents the denominator of the fraction when the entire large rectangle is shaded, we say that the whole is shaded. We have two voles that are shaded. The whole is a number that precedes the fraction. So if you have a fraction, the whole will be what? The part of the fraction that is located to the, the left. Right. So the whole precedes the fraction like these numbers that we have here to the left. right to the left so when the entire six divisions are shaded then that represents a whole we have two voles that are shaded. The whole is the number that precedes the fraction. So there are your voles. We have how many of them? Two voles. Right, two voles. In the other large rectangle, only five parts out of six are shaded. Five will be the numerator of the fraction the numerator tells us the number of those equal parts that we are talking about how many of those equal parts are we talking about in this region that we have shaded five. right so the numerator will be five the correct answer is represented by option D. D so when we have the rectangles divided into six equal parts and all parts are shaded for those rectangles the shaded region represents a whole in each case but when we have the rectangle divided into six equal parts and not all of them are shaded then we have to count the number of shaded parts and that will be the number of parts out of six that are shaded and that will represent the fraction that is shaded in that particular case a child was asked to write what is that number Jerry 792.8 he wrote what you see on this table or this chart 
what should he change in order to be correct and we have the suggestions right here but as religionists say and also bankers say never use the counterfeit to identify the real use the real to identify the counterfeit so that is what we are about to do don't use the counterfeit to prove the real rather use the real to disprove the counterfeit write the correct thing so if you write down the correct thing it is easier than having to be going through the entire thing searching for what is not right so if we put the right thing down then the wrong thing will automatically show up so what do we say in this particular case write down 972 what is the number jerry 792 eight so we will write down 792 Two. write that down seven hundred nine tens and two ones so the number has seven hundreds nine tens and two ones seven hundreds nine tens and two ones so seven hundreds nine tens and two ones writing a number that comes after a point is not difficult as the decimal fraction is read digit by digit it is even easier in this particular case as we only have one digit in this particular case so just put the eight down what is different in the two numbers now jerry we know that the second one that we write is correct because yes. we are writing the correct thing so what is different in the other set the, se the seven you have nine and seven in the hundreds then you have nine and nine in the tens in the ones you have two and two and in the tens you have eight and eight so what is not what is there that should not be there in the first one the nine which nine okay so the nine hundreds we need to replace so replace nine in the hundreds place with seven replace nine in the hundred place with eight which one replace nine in the hundreds place with seven, seven. and that is represented by option D. D everything would be a perfect match if he replaces the nine in the hundreds column with a seven option d is therefore correct